p.m. on a what is today Wednesday I think I've lost track of days it's um, like that it is like that it's dark outside that's what we can go with I know it is dark outside it is a day of the week and we are here with Julia Baird who is fresh off the drum you still have the makeup on the dress yeah. everything yeah to talk about your beautiful new book and I have a copy here phosphorescence I'll just bring that on all wonder and things that sustain you when the world goes dark. So we are going to have a lovely chat this evening. And, of course, be, feel free to um, send in comments, send in uh, questions, and we'll get to them in due course. But for the meantime, I, I feel like, Julia, this book has a life of its own. I think back when um, you and I first talked about it in 2017, was it 2017? Yes, okay. I know. I went back through all of my emails right. to to work out when we first started talking about this book and how long it took you to write and so on. Um, but I just, when you first came to me with the idea for this book, which I loved immediately, of course, neither of us could have possibly predicted that it would come out in exactly the same month that the world goes dark, quite literally, right. when the lights turn off and um, offices shut down and people go home. And that this book, which is all about um, finding the things that sustain you through hard and difficult times, would be coming out at this period of like just overwhelm and uncertainty and confusion and anxiety and loss and discomfort. And it feels somehow fated, you know? Mm. Do you feel that? Well, yeah, I've had a lot of people say that to me. I mean, it really, as you know, it really was more of like a, in the case of emergency, break glass kind of situation. Mm. <laughs> but then I suddenly, when the book comes out, there's this sound of glass splintering everywhere, you know? Mm. Um, look, I have to say that this was, it was just, you know this so well because it was just a book I had to write. And in fact, when you and I were talking about it first, the first time, we were meeting about another book, which I'm still going to do at some yes. point. Right? And we had the whole meeting about it. And at the end of it, I was like, you know, I've got this other idea. And I don't know, what do you think? And you, you just went, bing. Um, and you kind of immediately understood what it was going to be. And you also understood that because my American publishers kind of had some different ideas for things they wanted me to do but I just had to write it. it I just had thought hard about it and I'd been through some things but also kind of wanted to write about joy through it all as well and it was so hard to explain what it actually was it yes. still was a little bit but it was such a relief yeah. with you because even before I could articulate it you could almost articulate it better than I could so no there's no way either of us could have predicted it and it's not like Again, either of us were very um, particularly cynical about, oh, I, you know, there's a great gap in the market for some <laughs> violent in essence, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it was just like you understood a bunch of things I had to say and you trusted that it would happen in the right way and you helped me get it in a right way. So, yeah, mm. about that. Uh, talking about how to describe the book to people, that is that is interesting because it's something I still struggle with. And <laughs> I say variously, it's, you know, a book about getting you through the hard times. Um, it, is, um, a, it, is a, it is a book of essays, I say. It's got a bit of science in it. It's got research in it. It's got a bit of psychology in it. I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a self-help book because I think that that term is you know, it's it's problematic. Right. Um, but it is a book that will help people who read it. But, you know, I just, I think it's a book that is really hard to describe. It's like multi-genre. It's a little bit of memoir, for example. Did you find it hard to write? No, I found it easy to write. And, and that's because you kind of just allowed me to be creative. I, I, I really like... Um, I really like that kind of books that kind of weave in memoir and then talk to a few different people and see if they can back it up. But I also really like being able to put thoughts and observations in fragments. I was glad that you were kind of were okay with me doing that too in the middle of something to talk about how when soldiers got cuts in the Civil War, you know, their wounds were phosphorescent and people were like, what is that, you know? Um, and they had all kinds of superstitions about it, but it was kind of it, it knitting back together, but they called it angel's glow. So just popping that in somewhere, popping another study about 
the fact of these Japanese young men that found that they glowed actually yeah. not in the dark but all through the day that we all glow. Um, no, in that sense, I found it really freeing to write actually. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to be anything else, so yeah. Yeah, I. It feels to me like you started. You just started tugging on the things that interested you. You started yeah. with this notion of phosphorescence, the, both the real phosphorescence, you know, the, uh, and there is a difference between bioluminescence and phosph phosphorescence, isn't there? Yeah. I always get them confused. Yeah, but, but both phosphorescence, the real thing, and then phosphorescence as a metaphor, that inner light that sustains us, that gives us that strength that we can draw upon later when times are hard. Yeah. You just started tugging on that piece of string and then it feels like the world opened up to you. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's kind of weird, isn't it? It was almost like unconscious in the sense that there was just a bunch of things I had to say. And it wasn't until I landed on this metaphor of phosphorescence that I was like, oh, that's what it is. It's not like, sorry, I'm on my bed, so it's bouncing when I'm here. <laughs> sorry. Um, you know, that's what it is. It's not like... You know, we talk we talk a lot about happiness. I've read so many happiness yes. studies, books and research papers. I'm kind of interested in the way people study it and how hard it is to study it mm -hmm. and how happiness doesn't capture contentment. And But then when you go through hard times, as very, very, very many of us do, then um, you get a sense that do, why don't we ask the other question about how you survive those times and endure those mm -hmm. times and continue mm -hmm. to um you know, it's not even it's not even glow. It's really just stay alive, and and that was the idea. It's so a bioluminescence. So phosphorescence is when you soak up the light of the sun or something, and then you re-emit it slowly over mm. a period of time mm. after everything goes dark. Right? Bioluminescence mm. is like the chemical reaction of tiny little creatures, phytoplankton, mm. right. out in the ocean, mm. and they um they light up. To, yeah. The um, creatures who have their own inner light. Yeah, exactly. It, but it's like when you start investigating something and then you see it everywhere. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in history and in science and in culture, suddenly these moments of what you see as inner light, you know, that beautiful quote from Emily Dickinson that you use at the beginning of the book about the inner light, that's, um, I think she said, that's genius or that's poetry, yeah. isn't it? But that yeah. is the thing that, you know, that sparks you. Yeah. Um, I feel like this book, it grew and grew like Topsy to encompass so much. So you started off with those big questions of awe and wonder yeah. um, and, uh and then it kind of grew to expand, like there were essays on dogs and spoken word poetry and um, yeah, uh, silence and activism and astronauts and all along the way. And I think even like really at a very late stage, um, we were looking at things in the footnotes and I was saying, can you include that? That is yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Do you feel like you could have just kept, kept going? going? Yeah. I do. I do. Mm. And in fact, I've got a couple more chapters in my mind or sections in my mind at the moment that I may yeah. or may not sneak into, say. We could have a revised edition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, it is because it's not like I wasn't writing a definitive prescriptive, um, this is a roadmap for one's life. It was these are things that sustain you and you will, people will find their own way. The, I mean, and obviously, because I'm no philosopher or theologian or anything like that, it's not about a whole new way to live. It's more that if you endure something pretty horrible and you have to stare like your mortality in the face or just your own smallness in the universe or your impotence in the face of something that seems really overwhelming, then you do have to work out what gets you through, you know, and you, we might want to get through it ourselves. We might want to get other people through it. And I, moreover, like for me, it was, it's, it's nature. I think a lot, for a lot of people, mm. nature, there's so mm. much research about the healing properties of nature. But for me, it was ocean swimming mm. um, and my dog and all those kinds of things. And there is also research about dogs and, mm. and wonder. But I think through it all, it was the sense that I had to be, you, you, all I could say is you have to be open to it. You think about it and you live yeah. deliberately in the sense that I know yeah. that 
things bring me a sense of peace. I know these things give me a strength or make me happy. I'm going to build that into my life very deliberately and kind of see what difference it makes. And mm -hmm. it, I think it's pretty remarkable. Yes, and I want to get back to that notion of um, being deliberate about it. But at the moment, I, I just want to go back one, one little step to yeah. – in the book, um, I'm always curious about beginnings of books and that kind of that particular kernel or, you know, like the sourdough starter. So many people yeah. are, are making bread these days that clearly that yeah. sourdough starter is on my mind. But that little sort of that fizzing, fermenting thing that is the start of a book and or an idea or a, an artwork or, but for me, most particularly books. And for me, um, it feels like, that the particular sort of sourdough starter in your case was um, the, you know, the experience of ex encountering phosphorescence when you were, I think, a teenager maybe, yeah, going yeah. down to seal rocks with your, yeah. with your friends and, and experiencing it in the waves. And then there's that moment also, I guess, of, of crisis in a sense when you, you were heartbroken a few years ago and you said yeah. you went to visit a counsellor. Yeah. And what did he say to you? Yeah, well, this goes back to the very, very idea of phosphorescence, so kind of pulling in the light of the sun, right, to re-emit it. So this counsellor said to me, it was really, and I'd spoken to him a couple of times and I was just called him one time and I'm like, I was so bereft that day and I was just like, I do not know how I'm going to get through this, you know. And he just said that that when he was growing up and he was a young man, one of his mentors, you know, I always forget if it's Chile or Argentina, but one of his very kind of passionate speaking mentors, slapped him on the face and said, listen, everything that you've ever been taught, everything that you've ever read, the, every you know hug you've ever been given, every friend, everything you've been, you know, everything you've had in your life, you know, every piece of art you've ever seen, um, a bit of music you've ever heard, every fragment of anything beautiful, now is when you draw on that. This is when all of that matters. And I got really interested in the sense that, do we have a reservoir of kind of of things that we've been taught and things that we know or faith that we might have that we can draw on to to give us strength? I think that often people go, okay, something bad has happened. I'm going to get like a self-help book. I'm going to go off and do a course. And I'm going to like learn how to do something new. But what about the sense that you've, you've already been given it? There's a lot of this stuff that you already know. You have to work out a way to kind of create a stillness so you draw on it. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It's almost it's almost about taking those things that are instinctive within yourself and then doing them quite deliberately. Exactly. You, you talk about the simple, powerful lessons you learn in the book about, and the first, which, and I think it's the most important, um, the first lesson is pay attention, um, yes. which I just personally love. I've, you know, through these kind of dark times, I've been reading a bit of poetry because that I find what is the thing that... Reading? Uh, there, there is a poet called Ross Gay who I am just loving. Oh at my the god! Yes. Oh my no! <laughs> when you said, "Is there another video you want to write?" I would love to write a section on delight. Yes, because right? he wrote this book. Because I was yeah. gonna, I was gonna tell you about it because I thought oh you would god. love it. This book of delights. I have um, to tell you though, and this is for everyone too. Yeah. This American Life did a fantastic at the end of January. They did a one-hour show on delight, mm -hmm. and Ross gave features throughout it. Yeah, they keep coming back and interviewing him. And it's completely gorgeous. Yeah, it, it, that would be absolutely marvelous. And I, mm -hmm. as your publisher, say you must write this extra chapter. <laughs> but <laughs> he, he talks about um, attending to what delights you is a muscle. So it's yes. it's about paying attention and and looking at it and examining it. He also said. Um, the more you study delight, the more delight there is to study. I felt my life to be more full of delight, not without sorrow or fear or pain or loss, but more full of delight. And I just thought, oh, that is so what you are saying. Yes, exactly. I mean, we all instinctively, you know, for some people it might be, um, you know, I, I don't know, drawing or playing with your toddler or it might be playing guitar, or it might be sitting under a tree in a park, but we all instinctively know what delights us. But sometimes it's about 
focusing on it and paying yes. attention. Yes, mm. in real life. Like there's other, there's a lot of things that delight us online. Like we see the most gorgeous videos, especially about dogs. <laughs> of like, I was watching one this morning about a dog that was born with, I don't know what the syndrome was, and this dog could not walk and its legs was flying. And then yeah, I watched it go through its whole rehab until this little dog was running around. Um, I can post the links. We let it so cute. And I was so happy by the end of it. Um, and I think that we do actually often go online for those little snap, snaps and, you know, snippets, yeah. videos. Mm -hmm. I think it's diluted a bit when it's not in real life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we should really seek it there as well um, and be deliberate about it. And I've really noticed that during this time about paying attention. A lot of people yeah. came to me and said, oh, my God, I spent ages looking at these bees in my front yard and they're so incredible, like this and this happened, like even strange <laughs> things like that. And someone wrote to me and said, I know this is going to sound really strange, but I was reading a book and then I took my kid down um, some platoon or somewhere they were diving off the water and I was sitting there and then I noticed after she splashed in the water, the way the drops come up is so crazy. Like they come up in this really wild way. And she's like, I know that sounds ridiculous, but I was sitting there and looking at that. And yeah. that's right. I mean, the whole arc of the book, as you know, ends in the final conclusion that we must pay attention and not to the world outside and to other people and the joy oh. of other people and friendship, oh. but also the suffering of other people um, and often the best way to distract yourself from your own ruminations or things that you can't do anything about often you can yeah. do about helping out someone else so. yeah and and that's something that I, I i very much liked as well um which is around community um because you talk about in the book somewhere about the awe that we feel like in cathedrals or in redwood forests or yep. um it's where we feel both small and insignificant, which is good. It's good for us to feel that way. But you also talk about an, um, or you um, talk about um, an example of a scientist studying people who go into a museum and they see a replica of like, or a T-Rex, mm. this gigantic beast, you know. And so not only do we feel smaller after having been in the presence of this um uh, you know, this gigantic, you know, hunter carnivore. But it is, and you say somewhere, we, it quiets our self-interest for a moment and folds us into a social collective, which I loved because it it is about that feeling of community, I think, yeah. isn't it? That, that's, yeah. And if there was any good to come out, if there was any awe or wonder to come out of COVID-19, it is that we feel part of a greater community. I, the things that have been giving me so much pleasure are watching those videos online of people clapping on their balconies or um, the Spanish policemen paying, you know, driving down these deserted streets and getting out to play guitar and sing. And yeah. that's when we all realise we're in this together. It oh. is a beautiful feeling. We get goosebumps. Um, by the way, we're getting some beautiful notes of delight along the side here. Someone was like... Someone was looking at the stars with her kids. Um, yes. Someone else has been noticing autumn leaves in a whole new way. And someone else had like a um, ice cream mm. with their 10-year-old kid after on a bench outside after a day of online schooling. Yes. So there's so many gorgeous examples. Yes. Um, but, yeah, look, if there's absolutely, I, every time I see the footage of people clapping um, at 7 o'clock around the world, the healthcare workers, I get goosebumps. I had a doctor on the show tonight who was a cardiologist who gave up his normal work and has been working in ICU, and he choked up with tears quite a bit in uh, in the interview. And in one of them, he just said he can't actually walk out through the streets and hear that sound without starting to cry because... Yeah. I mean, just, just that support and that concern, but also what he does in New York affects what happens to us here. We, we, we are so intricately connected. We're closing our borders, but at the same time realising how much we need each other. And yes. um, I think that's been, there's been a really strong sense of that. Yeah. Um, and it's really, it's really important. It's, we've, seen some, yeah. we've seen some very beautiful examples, I think. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Please, everyone, feed through questions to us because, you know, this is the ideal time to speak to Julia. She's got coffee. She's got, she's got tea. She's got hey. chocolate. So yeah. <laughs> now is the time. What has been your experience of the response to the book? 
Uh, have mm. you, is there, has there been anything that has surprised you or delighted you? Uh, yeah, I'm delighted by those things. I've been, one thing that's delighted me is the, the photos that people have taken of themselves reading the book or just of the book in their hands. And it's always beautiful. Like there was often a dog looking nearby or they had like great setup of just like even just like a biscuit and a cup of tea. That is just happiness. That to me, yeah. that like the book, a cup of tea and a, and a cookie. Sometimes it'll be like be some, near some beautiful trees or like I discovered they're called glisks when the light comes out of the clouds in this kind of single pond. Yeah. I've had a yeah. few photos with glisks. Um, I've been really touched by the number of people that have written to me and about, you know, some of the times they've had and how they've felt really reassured and really comforted. Like that is the number one thing that that, that is all I need to kind of hear and know is because that was my intent to hope that, just my hope actually, that by getting some things down that it's mm. sustained me, it, it, there might be some comfort for other people. So that just makes me very, very happy. And, um, and yeah, people have written about lots of little stories of, um, of delight or of joy or a connecting with the whole idea of phosphorescence, um, tiny drops of drops of stillness going through their day, um, how crazy it must be to see flowers around us all the time. A lot of talk about nature and how restorative it is. And actually one other um, chord that seems to have been struck is about religion and I think that a lot yeah. of people, yeah, just with everything that's going on now and some of the very kind of egregious or obvious failings or concerns about the, the church and the fact that religion is often spoken about by a very small and particular group of people they don't know there seems to be an interest in the fact that let's just boil it down and put aside a lot of the legalism and just work out how to love each other better like isn't that what it is or isn't that what it is like and that was yes. how to do that yeah. can we yeah. talk about how we do that so yeah 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 beautiful do, would you describe yourself as an ore hunter now yeah, totally. Oh. I am definitely a bioluminescent hunter. <laughs> was, I found ghost mushrooms near my place recently, and but I went back two nights later and they were already eaten up. So I've been going like, I've been going on quite a few ghost mushroom walks. Um, okay. I really would like to see some fireflies. Mm. Um, Have uh, you ever seen fireflies yeah, in the wild? In America, when I was growing up, and a few years ago in Virginia, where I was mm -hmm. in Spain, I saw a big bunch of fireflies. Um, and obviously I've saw bioluminescence down the south coast recently. Mm, um, mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and also a lot of wonder. I mean, this week mm. in my swims, I saw like yesterday I saw a cuttlefish. No, 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 a um jellyfish that was as big, it was like a barrel, absolutely huge thing. That I'm just swimming through this blue and then you're like, what? This big pink thing. And the day before I know I've written about this from the book and it's regular, but it is a continual thing for me. I did see, I was like, I wonder when the cuttlefish are coming back. And then I saw five little babies all swimming along. I thought it was like wrinkling weed at first and then another one shot out and another one shot out and they took off. I tried to take off after them, but they were too fast. So, yeah, I'm very deliberate about trying to find all that stuff. And my kids really get it now too. Yeah. Like I just filled it in. Yeah. Now. Do you talk to them about awe and wonder? Yeah. Do you use those words? Oh, no. Mm. I don't really. No. I just drag them outside and get them to look at stuff, really. Yeah. Kids kind of do naturally anyway, but mm. um, we just we just pay attention to the stuff that we're seeing. If I made it like an ac academic exercise or anything that's, that they would run a million miles from me. It's um, got to be joyous, doesn't it? Yeah, totally. With kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Exactly. And, you know, like for ages they'd heard me because um, they don't really swim with me. My, my little boy used to kayak and for ages they were like, yeah, yeah, phosphorescence. But then when we actually saw it down the south coast at the end of January and it was unbelievable, these curling blue waves, and to, to be jumping around with my kids and my friend Kath's kids and it was like midnight and it's pitch black and the sky is full of stars and... Um, there was almost no light around us apart from the stars and these stars, you know, in the ocean as well and all over our bodies and little sparkling footprints. They couldn't get over it and I think they mm. got it. And they got what I was going on about. Oh, my God. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. And you didn't even have to teach them. Yeah, exactly. It was just there. Yeah. What is, um, what is maybe the fa your favourite detail from this book that you found out in the course of your research? What? What is the nugget that you that you most enjoy? My favourite detail. 
I don't even think of a single detail. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, I love all the I love all the studies. I mean, I loved finding out about the overview effect, but that actually had a there were a lot of things here I was interested in, and then I discovered that they had a name, right? Yes. So the fact that uh, the, the, there is actually a psychological syndrome for astronauts going coming back and really being changed when you read their work mm. it's and it's beautifully written really poetic philosophical stuff and they have been profoundly transformed mm. primarily by seeing the earth disappear behind a thumb and by seeing how small we are and the stuff we were talking about before how we're connected yes. how the earth is fragile how we need to protect it how that mm. task is urgent mm. the overview effect i think is a really fantastic idea um mm. Like Freud and Freud, I kind of love discovering that as a concept as well. I didn't know that yes. there was such a Do you word. want to tell people about Freud and Freud? Yeah, so we talk about um, Schadenfreude a lot, which is the pleasure you take in another's misfortune. And um, what we don't really talk about is flip side, which is um, its better twin, which is Freud and Freud. And I found out about this when I had a friend of mine who's this really beautiful person who set up this thing called the Sydney Story Factory and um, they teach creative writing to a lot of disadvantaged kids and um, it's really great work and she built it up from absolute scratch I mean to the point at which I can remember us all painting the spines and her putting the applications and knocking on doors getting money and um, they've got two bits, um, two places in Sydney now in Redfern and in Parramatta but a couple of years ago she was made the Australian Local Hero of the Year and, and you know of course our tribe, we were all texting each other and just super happy and excited and watching her on television accept the award. And for the whole day after, I just had this really tight, happy feeling in my chest. And I was like, well, we're going to talk about this. Like, this feels so good. I'm so happy, right? Oh. Um, and then I dug around online. I was like, oh, it's called Freudenfreud, like the pleasure you take in the success of another person, of a friend or a loved one. And there's other terms in other languages, you know, Medita and so on, which are a, a similar kind of idea. But actually, like some psychologists use that as like a training thing or as an antidote to depression in aged care places with some elderly patients. They call it Freudenfreud enhancement technique, where you try to... <laughs> <laughs> we try to think about good stuff that other people are doing and kind of yeah. think how great that is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that one of the things you've said is that this, um, you know, this is, uh, and it gets back to that notion of living deliberately, looking with attention, um, being open to joy, uh, and looking for wonder in the world is, is not easy work. It's not... Um, Mm -mm. You, you know, you, you know, you can't turn it off and on. It's not a hashtag. It's not. Um, uh, no, it, it's not necessarily kind of sort of like just like oh, I'm just going to sit back and write hashtag blessed. No. You know, you've got to work for it. You've got to pay attention, and you've got to take the time and do all of that. But one of the things was, and I was curious about this, is that you said at one point you know, I'm not advocating that we be Pollyannas, but I went back to Pollyanna and that book and, uh, you know, as, as egregious and awful as that book is, in some ways it is a lesson for us because it's a, she, she plays what she calls the glad game where she looks for something that makes her glad in yeah. any situation. Right. And, yeah, she was right. That's all I just wanted to say, really. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> We've given Pollyanna a really hard time over mm. the years. And, you know, yeah. maybe she was a really, actually, she was just ahead of her time. Absolutely. Because it's about the self-talk, isn't it, that you do. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, it's so easy to to, um, I think, to engage in that self-talk that's not helpful. I think, yeah, I mean, that's right. I think I was mm. using the sense of, oh, well, you know. That Everything's like, fine. Definitely bright, like it's mm -hmm. all fine kind of thing. And I did not want to write from that place at all. I did not want to write and say I don't completely accept that the world can go dark and things can be completely awful. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying just go out and lie under a tree and you'll sit back home and everything will be fine. It's just mm -hmm. like making the effort to do that might just make you a little bit better just yeah. for a day or maybe if you do it like a month in a row. I don't know. Yeah. But way yeah. trying to kind of extract yourself from that. And also in the sense that there's so much going on in the world right now, um, with, obviously with the pandemic, with climate change, with all the seemingly intractable problems we have. And it's not going to go away because you spend time looking at sparkles on a seafloor. But 
I tell you what, we all need to be as strong as we can to be able to tackle it and so we need to work out what it is that makes us strong. I yes. That's what, that's what I was yes. Yeah. Um, Catherine says, um, this is uh, someone who's listening, for the first time in so long, I'm not feeling guilty for staying home and enjoying how lovely my in immediate environment is. I live my life creating beautiful gardens for other people but rarely grant myself time in my own garden. So, you know, that... That is a beautiful story. Okay. Jane asks, how long did it take you to write the book from sitting down day one to the final page? It's so hard to say. Okay, so when did we speak? 2017? It was late 2017, I think. Late 2017. I got you a draft at the end of 2018. Uh, yes, because I gave you some notes at, yeah, in December 2018. It was really... Mm -hmm really not good but you helped me through that stage um and then um maybe like maybe last year when did i get it to and i think I yeah it like must have been mid 2019 mm. but i wrote it in bits and pieces i had surgery in the middle of it like i would mm. sometimes i would just write for a day at a time i mean hour, an hour at a time and that would be enough and that was mm. kind of my happy place Mm. Um, it was such a pleasure to write, like just to yeah. think through things of beauty. It really was. Was it different? A different writing experience to your biography of Queen Victoria, <laughs> which was so monumental and so you had to be um, both bold and careful. You know, you're dealing with a biography. Uh, you know, just she's been written about many times before, and yeah, it must have been easy easier. Oh, so much easier. Mm, mm, mm. Stuff that I, I mean, with Victoria, I was entering another world and another century, and you have to be really imaginative um, to create scenes and worlds, but you have to pack it with so much knowledge. Sure. Um, I loved it. I loved the research, and um, I actually really loved the writing of it. But, yeah, it was much more exacting mm, mm. process. And this was almost, honestly, it was like almost half the time from my subconscious you know when you're writing and writing and then like what am i trying to say what is it i'm trying to say here mm. it was almost like realizing half the truth that i was trying to say something about phosphorescence um, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Even that chapter on honoring the temporary it took, and it was yes the very last draft that i worked out what i was trying to say yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. And I went back to your original proposal um, where you talked about, and you talk about this too in one of the lessons. I think you say it's your second lesson. Do mm. not underestimate the power of the ordinary. Do you want to talk me through a little bit more what you mean by that? The soothing power of the ordinary. The that soothing often, power like, of the ordinary. Even or, like we're talking about some people looking at bugs in your backyard or the behaviour of like mm. birds around you or the way your children carry on about some stuff, you know. I do really delight um, in my kids' nonsense and just watching their brains just be so freakish and strange. Um, I love watching the strangeness of my children. And... Honestly, the fact that, as it was a Catherine that just said to you, I just really, it's allowed me to be at home and to be amongst my own things. Like, mm -hmm. for me, like a cup of tea and maybe some chocolate, but a cup of tea and a book out of my front porch is just like the most massive recipe for happiness. Yeah, heaven. Um, I, the, you've got that little bit in the book where um, some American magazine once asked you to no. describe your three favourite things is that right three favorite possessions and you were quite um uh you didn't give them what they wanted no. tell, tell us what you gave them what you what you described as your three favorite things like uh you know alexander mcqueen beret and, <laughs> and something yeah, yeah, yeah. um i said my push bike mm -hmm. and my teapot and your teapot. That is the detail that made me just fall in love with you. I thought that that was just so excellent. I, I can't it. remember what the third thing was. You know, I can't remember now either. Yeah. Someone else will maybe be able to remind me. <laughs> my push bike and my teapot and something else really ordinary, actually. But, I, you know, um, I love those things. But I don't really ride my bike anymore. That was when I was living in Philadelphia oh, and everything yeah. was completely flat. Yes, so, but yeah. instead you've, done, you've gone ocean swimming. So yeah. that is... That is the ordinary thing maybe that delights you. Actually, yes. 
Um, Kathy Robbins, Robert, Robertson says, as Joseph, Joseph Campbell said way back then, follow your bliss. I Look, I think that's probably a, a beautiful note to end on, um, unless people have some other questions that I haven't quite seen. Um, I don't see one higher up. There, there is some beautiful, beautiful oh, moments in here. Swimming for those of us who are landlocked. Mm. Um, just anything in nature, anything to get yourself out there. And actually without, sorry, I'm so sorry, but this is bobbing away on my bed. Um, anything that's rhythmic and repetitive I think is really good. Um, just, just, just get out amongst it mm. as much as you can. Plants, trees in any of the wild natural worlds, which is still possible to do in a lot of lockdown because we're exercising. Mm. Yeah. So therefore, we're able to go out. Um, and yes, I've noticed that so many more people are out on, you know, the Bay Run that I go to and right. suddenly it's crowded. People are taking every opportunity they can to walk their dogs or get out in the sunshine or go to the park. And Right. Yeah. Because we can. And actually, because we can and we need to. It's really, really great. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not all about swimming. Not everyone loves it and not everyone loves the cold and some people mm -hmm. freak out about the... About the young sharks, I completely understand that. But um, has anyone like Attenborough filmed Shelley Beach? Oh yes, David. This is on phosphorescence. Um, David Attenborough has a whole—I forgot the name of it. He's got a whole documentary about luminescent creatures around the world. It's like the world that glows or creatures that glow. It's mm -hmm. fantastic. Okay, we should put a link in there as well. Yeah. Okay, we should put a link into that as well. Um, okay. Um, any other writing projects in the works? That uh, that question is from Sharon. Well, um, yes, I'm writing a whole bunch of things. Um, like as Catherine knows, every now and then I'll just send her a little paragraph going, "How about this?" and she'll like totally get it and write back, and then I have just have to write it. <laughs> now you have to write it. Um, yeah, I know. So the, the, I am I am going to work on another biography. Um, in, in lockdown, it's a bit trickier in terms of travel and so on. Um, but I also want to expand on some of the things I've thought about in phosphorescence and pull them out into a, a bit more. But I'm still in that subconscious level now. I just kind of grunt to Catherine and then just <laughs> give me some words back. It's that dreaming period that yeah, every no, good like book that. needs to go through. Do you know? Like that. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And Adam Courtenay asks, what to do when we're free again? Um, again, it would be, I don't know. I mean, some of the stuff that we're doing now is good. Yeah, it would be to, you know, think about the things that that bring you joy. And if, it, you know, getting out in the natural world, as we've been talking about, is a really big part of that. Um, and finding things that, a genuinely awestruck like when was the last time you were awestruck by something and mm. kind of do that and um a lot of the things that have happened in, during this time have that have narrowed our worlds i don't actually think is necessarily such a bad thing when we're just you know being with our friends and being still i think stillness is a really um really important way to be so yeah i've got many ideas like in a book for things that I've done that have made me really joyful. And I think it's about just op opening yourself up to all those kinds of possibilities. And then once you're aware of what it is that brings you joy or what it is gives you that kind of sense of peace, like, you know, like then you then you will pursue it deliberately. You know, when you go and stand in a forest or a massive stand of redwoods and you that, that feeling, like what is that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what drove like half of this mm. book. What is that feeling? Mm. Do I feel mm. so restored mm. mm. by that? No, Catherine, when was the last time you had an experience like that, do you reckon? What's your little... Oh, there was a moment. Um, I We have a little park up the road. It's just a, you know, it's a beautiful park. I'm so happy that it's so close. Yeah. And I was there the other day and it was that moment between, you know, that liminal moment between twilight and dusk and the sky mm. is this beautiful colour and it was quite quiet and I could just hear the wind through the trees that that's susurrate I don't know what what that word is sure. but it was susurration or something and it was just quite just hearing the 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 wind through the leaves and it and it felt like time stopped and slowed down and that was a moment you know that was a heart moment that was 
Right. Special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the wind yeah. The, and the trees. I know you feel like such a hippie, don't you? I saw something the other day when, when it was in Iceland or somewhere and there was this news article saying that the Icelandic people are recommending that if you can't hug people, we should hug trees. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm like this arms wrapped around it. And I'm like, you know what? I mean, it could be worse. I don't really be a tree hugger. I know I sound like it a lot at the moment. <laughs> like so much pleasure from exactly what you've spoken about. And I take oh. my little boy out. We go walking. We've got a nature thing near us too, a, a national park. And I'm always like, wait, wait, close your eyes. Listen to that one. And we try to work oh. out which tree is making which noise. Oh. It's such a peaceful sound and sight actually, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, no, it, uh, it, it um, especially when I, um, th there's that phenomenon that you probably know that I only heard recently about crown shyness, where the tops of trees don't, you know, trees that are growing beside each other, the, 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 the they, they, they leave space for each other. It's called crown shyness. The top of the trees don't quite meet. And I just, I, I think trees are extraordinary things. Someone is saying that we should read the Overstory by. Oh um, yes, um, yes. I've got that on my desk. I yes. know. So maybe we should. I'm sure there's a crown. <laughs> like, that's a great metaphor, isn't it? Oh, trekking yeah. in Huon Valley in Tasmania. That mm. would all hugging pets. Yes. I'm very in favour of that. Yes. Yeah. So I think um, yes, everyone should drink more tea, have a favourite teapot, either go ocean swimming, hug trees, just. <laughs> Do what, do do the thing that delights you. Let's let's end on um, exactly. a note of delight. Exactly. Delight, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which apparently the etymological um, uh, uh, origin of the word delight is from light. Huh. Apparently. So there we go. That's one of the best things about doing this is that people are sending me photos of like yeah. bioluminescence and different yeah. creatures that are lit up and that's really cool. And iridescent, iridescent butterflies. Oh, yeah. yes. There's yes. So many Did butterflies. you get a photo of those? Yes. Apparently after the rains, um, mm. there's just been, and there's also a migration up and down the, I think, northeast coast at the moment. But it, mm. that is something delightful. Yeah. Yeah. Julia, thank you so much. After a busy day to sit down and talk about us talk about this book with us has just been a pure delight. So thank you very much to um, all the people who've been listening and, and writing these absolutely fantastic comments. I love them. And thank you very much, Julia. Thanks, Catherine. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Now we...